this morning watching people walk in. I thought, I don't know them, I don't know them, I don't know them. There's so many new people here, and that's just so exciting. And um, I really love that. And this is just a great way to kind of get the nuts and bolts of the announcements. Just all the stuff that's going on. Because we've got even more things going on, uh, you know, that's exciting than what we put on here. So thank you. Karina, you can put the, the title slide up there again. So we're in a series called Irresistible. And the reason that we're doing this series is because, part of it is because we have so much growth in the church and so many new people coming in. And we do church a little bit differently than some other churches. But really, I, I, I kind of, as I thought about the year and I thought, okay, man, we're growing and, and we're, we're growing and continue to grow. And we're about to go to two services. And I thought, man, I, I feel like we as a church need to make sure that we know who we are. And we need to make sure that we know why we do the things that we do. And who we are and why we do the things that we do are all centered around what Jesus teaches. This is not our own opinion. This is, this is the, the, what, the, what Jesus teaches in the Bible. And so I thought, man, it would be amazing if we could do a series around this. And, and I could talk about it on Sunday mornings. And then the Thursday night component... That's where we get together. We had 50 people here, like Sam said. We watched some videos. We did discussions. The discussion groups were just amazing. Anyway, it was a lot of fun. It was fun, but it kind of complements this. So uh, my heart, I think my, my big takeaway from this series is that you guys walk out knowing that there is an irresistible church, there's an irresistible Jesus, and then there's an irresistible love. Those three components are the things that I hope that you really walk away with after this series is done. Because those are the things that change my life. Especially, you know, this irresistible Jesus and this irresistible love part. Those things really change the trajectory of my life. So today, um, before we move on, I just want to bring us all up to speed on the definition of what it, what it means to be irresistible. So this is what I want you to think about. Every time I say irresistible, I will also say that uh, I've typed irresistible so many times and I still can't spell it that I went into my computer and I listed all the misspellings so that it would just autocorrect to, uh, to irresistible. So irresistible means that it's impossible to refuse, oppose, or avoid because it is too pleasant, it's too attractive, or it's too strong. So that, that's kind of the definition of irresistible. It's impossible to avoid. It's, it's impossible because it's too pleasant, it's too attractive, or too strong. And last week we ended the sermon with this really key point. Before we talk about anything else being irresistible, we needed to understand one thing, and that was that you were irresistible to God. So that means that you were too attractional to God. You were too uh, unavoidable by God. And, and what that is, is God is, 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 is choosing you. He's saying, I can't live, or well, God doesn't live, but God's God. But he's saying, I, I, I am not going to leave you. My people that I created, I'm going to pursue over and over and over and over again because you are irresistible to me. And, and it's this truth here that brings us why Jesus came and died for our sins. It's this truth right here that, that uh, explains why Moses was called to, to free the Israelites out of Egypt. It's this truth here why God appeared to Abraham and said, you're going to make, you know, a great nation is going to come from you. It's this truth here that Jesus came on the earth and he died for our sins and, and the curtain was torn and, and Jesus was opened up to everybody. It's this truth here that over 2,000 years later, we're still here. This is the reason why we show up on a Sunday and why we do what we do here in this church. It's because you're irresistible to God. But not everybody knows that and not everybody accepts that or understands that. And for me, that just breaks my heart. Just to imagine that, that, that there's, there's people going through stuff out there and some of you in here are going through things that are really hard. I know that someone in this room probably had a lonely night last night. Maybe a night that felt a bit empty. I felt like you were desiring, you know, meaning or belonging. I know that some of you are struggling with, with business and, and still getting over COVID and, and things like that and trying to, trying to work your business back into a positive place, and that's hard. Some people are struggling with family. Some people are struggling in their marriage. These are struggles that we all have. 
We all have these sins, you know, struggles. We're, we're trying to overcome addictions to alcohol and pornography and gambling and, and food and, and, uh, and shopping and relationships and all these things. We are all a mess. We are collectively and individually a mess. And you guys have appointed me as the pastor of the church, the, the lead mess that stands here on stage on Sunday morning. But we're all a mess. And the idea, see, so, so what I get to do is I get to wake up in the morning and read my Bible or, or just talk to God or listen to a worship song. Or even if I don't do any of that, when I lay my head down at night, I know that Jesus has died for me and I know that I'm sorted and I know I have a God that loves me. But there's too many people that don't know that. There's too many people that don't have the hope. They don't have all the stuff that comes with having Jesus in their life. Now that bothers me. It bothers me to know that there's hurting people that don't have access, haven't chosen the access of Jesus. And that's why we feel like we want to be irresistible to those people. And so today what we're talking about is we're talking about an irresistible church. And and we're, we're, we're talking about, what, okay, what does that mean to be an irresistible church? And we're going to kind of unpack that for you guys. But, but the first question that I asked when I thought about this is, I thought, okay, I want to give you up front where I'm going with this message. I don't want you to try and feel like you're saw, you know, trying to figure the Da Vinci Code out. Anybody see that movie, Tom Hanks, Da Vinci Code? Or no, maybe Nicolas Cage. No, but, okay, that's fine. It's just me. Thank you. Amen. Crowns in heaven for this guy. So, so I thought, let me just, I don't want to trick you guys. I don't want you to try and figure out where's Chris going? What's this mean? What's all this happening? You know, so I thought, I'm just going to tell you up front. So the, the, what we're going to talk about, we're going to answer the question of what, what is the church and what is its purpose? All right, so what is the church and what is the purpose of the church? Why are we here? Are you here because, well, that's just what you do. You get up on Sunday and you come here. But what, what's the purpose of it? And then the second thing is I want you to realize that no matter who you are, you can take that purpose that we figure out today out into the world and you can share that purpose with somebody. So so that's kind of the end result that we have here. And when you share the purpose that we discover with somebody today, guess what the potential is? The potential is, is that you share it with somebody that doesn't have the hope of Jesus that you have and they gain that hope. And then they gain life change. That's, that's what we want. Because we've all been in hopeless situations. We want to share that hope. So we want to be an irresistible church and take that purpose of the church out to other people. So that, that's what that means. And then also, I want us just to be able to, to return and sort of recapture the simplicity and the origin of the mission and vision of the church. To, to, you know, we overcomplicate this thing. Jesus is very clear what the message of the church is. Now, every church has their own mission statements. Every church has their own catchphrases and catch lines. But the mission and vision is the same. The Bible says what it is. It doesn't change. It's to go out and make disciples, love God, love others, serve Jesus, make disciples. That's what we're here to do. So we want to recapture the simplicity of that because it's not complicated. And then we're going to do that by creating environments that reflect the purpose and the personality of Jesus. Now, I know this word environments may throw you off, but you guys are in an environment right now. This is an environment that we hope reflects the purpose and the personality of Jesus. What was Jesus' purpose? Come die for your sins so you have access to God. What was Jesus' personality? We're going to talk about that when we get to the irresistible Jesus part in this series, but it was magnetic. So we, we want you to walk in here have a magnetically attractive experience with Jesus. Same for your kids out there in family ministries. You know what? You riding in your car, that's also an environment. Somebody cuts you off before you give them a lewd hand signal. You need to remember that in the environment of your car, you are to reflect the purpose and personality of Jesus. See, everywhere you go in your life, you're walking in and out of environments. So here's my appeal to you. My appeal to you is that this is something that you believe in. So I, 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 want you to, I want you to believe. I want you to believe that the purpose of the church has the potential to change people's lives. 
that by what we do in here and the way we do it to be irresistible to others, because we're irresistible to God, is there to change someone else's life or to change your life if you're here. Maybe this is your first Sunday here. I'd like to say welcome. You'll notice that, you know, maybe things are a little bit different around here. Everything we do, we do because we believe that Jesus is the only thing that can change lives. And so let's talk about exactly what the church is. So I've got a, a picture diagram for you guys. I like to use emojis. Um, the, the, I have actually have no idea how these two uh, emojis made it on there. <laughs> I really don't. This is not what I typed up in my computer, or maybe I was tired and I did, I did do that. But here's the idea. We, we've got the building, all right? So is the church the building? Verse, is the church people? Some of you are zombies. Uh, some of you guys are, are not. But, but we've got people, and then we have the building. So the building of the church. So let's say the building is the church. This, this structure that you sit under and that you come into on Sunday morning, let's say that's the church. If that building is the church, then in order for the church to win, then the building just needs to be nice. So the church wins if there's a nice doorway to come through, if there's a place to park. The church wins if if it's climate controlled, if the the chairs look nice, if the floor looks nice. If it's it's attractional when you walk in, you say, wow, I like this. There's a coffee roaster. That's cool. They've got coffee here at, at Camisa at the front. Like, this is a nice place. If the building is the church, then all we have to do is make the building nice, and then the building wins. The church wins. We, we don't even have to come here on a Sunday. It doesn't matter if you come or you don't come. But that, that's how kind of we, we would say, hey, if the building is the church, we just got to make the church look nice. But instead, I, I believe, and the Bible tells us, that the church is not the building. You know, th- this could happen anywhere. It could happen anywhere, anywhere, anywhere. Instead, the, the church is made up of the people. It's the people. And so if the church is the people, in order for the church to be successful, then that means that us as people need to understand a little bit about Jesus. You don't have to know the whole Bible. That Jesus came, he died for you, he cares about you, he loves you. That Jesus came because you were irresistible to God. That Jesus came because because he, he, he wanted you to have access to God. If we understand that purpose then all of a sudden, for us to call church a win as a body of people is for us to be an irresistible group of people. And what, what does that mean to be, for us to be an irresistible group of people? It means loving, kind. Uh, we can have fun with people. We can uh, greet people when they walk in the door. We can pray for people. There's a, there's a list of things to do. You guys know how to host people at home. You know, we try and do that here as well. But, but that's what creates the win. You guys are the church. doesn't matter if we're in this building or if we're in a tent or if we're somewhere else or we're on uh, a lawn somewhere or another building. You know, I have plans to have 10 or 20 buildings with 10 or 20, you know, churches in it all across Cape Town and even more and more and more and more. Why? Because there's always somebody else out there that needs Jesus. So we just keep pursuing that. So I've got some scripture that backs this up. So Let's, let's read a kind of rapid-fire scripture for us. So this is going to explain to you what the Bible says about how the people are the church and not the building is the church. So Matthew 18, 20. For where two or three are gathered in my name, so we've met that requirement, meeting together as my followers, I am there among them. So we can say, right now, this goes back to my appeal for you to believe Right now, there's two or three gathered in the name of Jesus. There's more than that. So right now, Jesus is among us. Now, if this group, if you get in the car, and there's three of you in the car, you're gathered in the name of Jesus, Jesus is among you. What Jesus is saying is, hey, all I need is some willing hearts. If you give me some willing hearts, I'm there. I'm there with it. So let's read another verse. Then we go on to 1 Corinthians 3, 9. For we, that's us, we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. 
See, God's saying it's not this building. He's saying that you are the building. That you are housing the heart that he wants. You're housing the heart that he speaks to. The heart that he works in. See, doesn't that, that should make you feel special. You're more special than a building. You're a, a living, breathing soul that Jesus died for. That Jesus cares about. That was irresistible to God. And here... God is saying, Peter is, is, or Paul is talking to the church in Corinthians, and he's saying, guys, you're God's building. God has built you. He knew you before the beginning of time. He, he knows every hair that's on your head. He knows everything there is to know about you, the good and the bad. And he still chose to send his son to die for you so that you could have a relationship with him. Why? Because you're irresistible. So let's go on to uh, another verse here that I've got. 1 Corinthians 3.16. Do you not know and understand that you, the church, so Paul's talking to people, the church, you are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells permanently in you, collectively and individually. So again, it's another verse talking about how you are the church. Where is the irresistible church? It's you. So then we ask the question, okay, if you are the church, if God is saying it's not the building and it's you, then what do we believe? Who, who is the church actually for? Who, who, who is that for? Is it for the Christian, the non-Christian, the insider, the outsider, the believer, the unbeliever? Is it for um, only one race and not another race and economic um, status or not? Like, who is the church for? Is it for people that keep ten, all the Ten Commandments? Is it for people that, uh, that live their life entirely by the rule? Is it for people that have sin, people that don't have sin? Who exactly is the church for? You know, we debate over that all the time. In fact, I know that people, even in this room, will say, you know, we should be more you know, accepting of this or that. They come up with whatever, you know, whatever it is, they complain. But then as soon as something, you know, kind of rubs them the wrong way or, or, or pokes them where they're uncomfortable, all of a sudden it's like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, that I'm not okay with. That, that we can't do. So, okay, so we need to clarify here who, who the church is for. Now, luckily, Paul has already gone ahead and he's done this. So there's Paul, who is one of my favorite people in the Bible. He likes to kind of stir the soup, or as, as we call it in my house, pee in the soup. And so Paul has gone out, and him and Barnabas have just kind of made a mess of the Jewish church. And the reason that they're sort of making a mess of this is, is they're going out, and they're taking the church, which is in them. They're not building buildings. They're taking the church in them to a people called the Gentiles. The Gentiles were people that were not the Jewish people. The Jewish people were the ones that put Jesus on the cross. Jesus was a Jewish person, but they're the Israelites that came from, uh, from Egypt and they, they came in. That, that's the Jewish people. And then everybody else is a Gentile, a sinner, or someone that can't have access to God. So those are your two people groups. And it's always been the Jewish people that had access to God and only them. Now, Paul is doing this crazy thing where he's saying, him and Barnabas are saying, hey, actually, the Gentiles also have access to God. So they're a little bit concerned because they're saying, Paul, you are coming very close to crossing a line because you're changing the culture of what we call the church, the temple, the synagogue. That, that, that's really what's rubbing them the wrong way. Paul, you're changing our culture. These people weren't Jewish. They didn't grow up Jewish. They don't know the law. You're just telling them about Jesus, and they just say yes, and then it's done? That's not fair. That's not right. That's not our culture. So they're having a bit of a, a debate here, but we'll, we'll start in verse 1. This is Acts 15. So some men came down from Judea and began teaching they began teaching the brothers. So what this is, is some other people, not Paul, not Barnabas, but other people have come down from Judea to this place, and they start teaching the congregation. So like teaching you guys something that maybe is not exactly true that Paul and Barnabas don't agree with. So that, that's the, the setup of the story. And what they're saying is, is unless you are circumcised in accordance with the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. 
To, you know, I, I've got a diagram of a circumcision. No, I'm kidding. Wouldn't that be funny? Yeah. I'm just asking you guys to sign up for a WhatsApp number. Paul, you know, this guy is saying, hey, you got to be circumcised here. So th- they're teaching people like, hey, according to the custom of Moses, if you want to be saved, if you want to be a part of this, that you have to be a circumcised male. And that, that's the way, that was their symbol. That was how they showed that they were a part of this, this uh, they were a part of the, the, the Jewish culture. And so they say, you can't be saved unless you're circumcised. But Paul and Barnabas, they disagreed greatly, and they debated with them. I wonder what it sounded like for Paul to disagree greatly. I, I just think that that would be, to be a fly on the wall and sit in on him arguing or yelling or proving his point. I, you know, I don't know, but... But they debated with them. So there was a back and forth exchange here. Paul's saying, you're wrong. That's not the way it works. They're saying, yes, that's the way it works. So if we go on to the next verse here in verse 3. So it was determined that Paul and Barnabas and some of the others from their group would go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and to the elders to confer with them concerning this issue. So after being supplied and sent on their way by the church, they, they go on. So you can go on to the next verse. So they went through both Phoenicia and Samaria, telling the detail of the conversion of the Gentiles, and they brought great joy to the believers. See, here's what's amazing, is they said, okay, we're debating, and we can't quite come to a place where we agree or we understand. So I tell you what, Paul, Barnabas, we're going to send you guys back to Jerusalem, back to the main church. You're going to go to the mothership. And when you get there, you're going to talk to the apostles, you're going to talk to the council, and you're going to say, here's the issue we're debating, we're arguing about, give us the final answer. And when you give us the final answer, that's the one that we're going to go with. So Paul and Barnabas, they start their journey, and along their way, they're just continuing to be the church. Now, hey, hey, the God is in us. We're two or more gathered. Paul, there's one. Barnabas, one, two. Two are gathered. Jesus is with them. And so they're telling everybody about what God is doing with the Gentiles. Hey, you thought only Jewish people could be saved. Turns out you don't have to do any body modification. And you can just give your life to Jesus. And the Gentiles are getting saved. And it's amazing. And so... He's telling them about the conversion, and it's bringing great joy to all the believers. This is good stuff. People are realizing that, hey, this church thing is irresistible. It's great. So when they arrived in Jerusalem, they were received warmly by the church and the apostles and the elders. So that's, okay, so they're coming in on good terms. So if we go on, and they reported to them all the things that God had accomplished through them. So they say, here's what God's doing out there, because you need to know what's happening. So then they come to a place, and it's Paul, it's Barnabas, and it's all the the Pharisees, the Jewish leaders, and the apostles. Old Peter, he's there, one of Jesus' 12 apostles, he's there. And so they're sitting around, and but for some of the sect of Pharisees, remember the Pharisees were the ones that put Jesus on the cross. But there's a a, a sect or a group of the Pharisees that kind of changed their mind, and they said, okay, we do believe that Jesus was was the Savior. So that sect of Pharisees who believed in Jesus as the Messiah, they stood up and they said, because obviously they'd been circumcised, it's necessary to circumcise the Gentile converts and to direct them to observe the laws of Moses. So that's their case. you got to still, they're hung up on this law of Moses thing. Hey, our culture is Moses. The laws that God gave Moses, they got to stick to that. And so then the next verse that goes on and, the apostles and the elders, they came together and they considered this matter. After a long debate, Peter. Now, Peter, one of the 12 disciples, he is, is put in charge. He got the, when Peter and Paul kind of divided, Paul got all the Gentiles. And Peter was in charge of kind of the Jewish church. So Peter, big man on campus, he's the big boss, the big boy here. So Peter gets up and he says to them, brothers... Do you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles would hear the message of the gospel and believe? So what Peter's talking about is an experience that he had with Jesus 10 years earlier. 10 years before this moment, Jesus told Peter that the word of God needs to go to the Gentiles. It was 10 years, which is amazing. So he says the Gentiles would hear the message of the gospel and belief. So let's go to the next verse here. It says, And God, who knows and understands the heart, see, he knows what's happening here, doesn't matter what's happening anywhere else, 
He knows what's happening here. Testified to them, giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he also did to us. So what he means there is when Jesus ascended to heaven, he said, I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. What's the Holy Spirit? It's God's helper. So without going into too much detail on that, he's saying that, hey, when when Jesus went to heaven, Jesus said, I'm going to give you something better than me. So he gives them the Holy Spirit, the helper. So these people receive this thing called the Holy Spirit, which is the helper. It goes to God's throne room. It groans for you. It shapes you. That's that thing that tells you that what you're about to do is wrong. That's that thing that kind of guides you. And so Paul is saying, just like when Jesus ascended to heaven and we were all in the upper room and the Holy Spirit fell on us and we received the Holy Spirit of God, just like that, that same Holy Spirit, it goes to the Gentiles because... He made no distinction between us and them. There's no distinction between the Jewish and the Gentiles. So cleansing their hearts by faith in Jesus. So now if we go on in in Acts here in verse 10. Now then, why are you testifying God by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we have been able to endure? And what's neat about this is Peter is saying, you're asking them to follow the customs and the culture of Moses, which none of us could do. Because if we could do that, there would have been no need for Jesus to come. So you're asking them to carry a burden and a load that we, we don't even carry as Jewish people? And so then he, he goes on here in verse 11, and he says, But we believe that we are saved through the precious, undeserved grace. Remember that word, grace. Of the Lord Jesus, which makes us free of the, guilt, of the guilt and sin, grants us eternal life in just the same way as they are. So again, Peter is saying, we all get the same grace. We're all saved by grace. Us and them. All of us. Saved by grace. And so then in, in verse 12 here, all the people remain silent. Some of them were probably mad. Some of them were probably happy. And they listened attentively to Barnabas and Paul as they described all the signs and wonders. So they're attesting to the miracles. So now they're saying, look, okay, because of that truth that Peter just told you, look at what's been happening out there. Are we happy about that? Shouldn't we be happy about that? You know, when this church goes to two services, three services, plants another building, buys another building, starts another campus, are we going to be mad? No, we're going to be super happy. Because a bunch of non-Christians or people that that don't go to church are going to have a church that they can go to. So they're happy about this. And so God's working amongst the Gentiles. And when they finished speaking, James replied, Brothers, listen to me. Now James is the the brother of Jesus here, one of the twelve. And he says in, in verse 14, he says that Simon Peter has described how God first concerned himself about taking from among the Gentiles a people for his name, to honor him and be identified with him. So he's saying, hey, in the beginning, God scooped up a bunch of people and said, you are going to be the Israelites, the Jewish people. So everyone was a Gentile. God said, I'm portioning Abraham's descendants to the side. They are now the Jewish people. But in verse 15, he says, the words of the prophet agree with this, just as it is written in Scripture. So, you know, James is saying, hey, Jesus, well, Jesus, Jesus was a Jew. He came and he fulfilled the Bible. And so everything that he did, everything that's happening now, what Jesus told Peter 10 years ago, all that still counts. All that is still good. And so now what I want to do is like interrupt the story a little bit and take you to 1 Corinthians. And this is a letter that Paul has written to the church in 1 Corinthians. For by one Holy Spirit we were all baptized to one body, spiritually transformed, United together, whether Jews or Greeks, Gentiles, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one Holy Spirit, since the same Holy Spirit fills each of us. And then James gives us one of the greatest uh, verses in the Bible that I, I believe it's one of the greatest verses for us as the church. And he says in Acts, James finishes off his, his speech. He basically says, okay, this is the end of it here. Therefore, it is my judgment... That we do not trouble and make it difficult for those who are turning to God among the Gentiles by putting obstacles in their way. So, we as South Point Church do not make it difficult for those that are turning to God. We don't put obstacles in their way. 
We are a wide open door, a wide open pathway for anybody and everybody. Because Jesus sees no distinction between us and them. We are wide open with our doors. We do not do things here that make it difficult for people to turn to God. Now what this brings up in all of us is a little bit of a struggle between grace and truth. So, so let, let, me under, let me explain this, this truth to you right here. We, we all struggle between grace and truth. Here's what that means. It means that like, okay... Can somebody come to church if they're not living the truth of the Bible? So can somebody who's living in sin come to church and then do they deserve to have God's grace? Or do you get God's grace first and then you can come to church and let the truth of God's word transform you? Or do you have to accept the truth of God's word, accept that you're a sinner, let that kind of do something in you, work in you, and then you come and you get the grace of God. Well, what comes first, truth or grace? Well, in some of us, or in all of us, there are certain things where grace comes first for you because you're not bothered by what the other person is doing. And then there's some things where truth comes first for you because you know what? You are bothered by what people are doing. You see people walk in the building, you say, hey, I know them. I saw them at Quick Spar. I know what they bought on Friday night. I know what's happening at their house. How, why are they here? They don't understand God. See, what Jesus did here is Jesus did this thing that we can't do. He split 50-50, grace and truth. They were both equal to him. You receive grace, you receive truth. You receive truth, you receive grace. You get it all. You know what's great about us as a church? We, we just don't have to worry about any of this. As a church, let's just be full of grace. Because like James said, we don't want to make it hard for people to come to God. We don't make it put obstacles in people's way to come here to this church. You know, wouldn't that be horrible if you were, people were walking in the door and, and you were kind of partitioned aside? Okay, if you're addicted to pornography, then you come over here. You can have access to rooms A, B, and C. If you're an alcoholic, well, that to us is not all that big of a deal. So you can have full access to everything in the church. You know, we, we, we can't do that because there's no grace in that. That's not an irresistible church. What's irresistible is when someone walks in here and they encounter you, the people, the church, and they're shown grace and they're shown love because you know that God's going to handle the truth part and you know God's going to handle the grace part. Let's just love on people. Let's just be irresistible. Now, the way that we're going to do that, and this is kind of the last thing I'm going to close with, there's, there's four or five things that we can do. These are important things for us. They're value statements for us. These things matter to us. And, and, and we're going to talk about drifting. This kind of like, this idea of a, of a drift here. And so the first one that we're going to look at is that we don't drift from outsiders to insiders. So like we don't want to be an inside, insider-focused church to where we do things that keep the insiders happy, but we don't think about the outsiders. So I actually kind of struggled with this because I don't like the idea of insider-outsider. That that's too much of like a language thing where I'm on the inside, I'm you know inside church, I do the church thing well, and you are on the outside. You know, something tells me, I know I'm an American, but South Africa struggled a little bit with categorizing people. You know, so I'm not a fan of inside outside, but it is an easy way to kind of just put words to it and explain it to say, hey, the way we do this service, the way we do kids ministry, the way we do small groups, the way we do everything we do, we do the way Jesus asked us to do it in an irresistible way because we put nothing in the pathway of somebody coming to church or coming to God and we don't make it tricky or difficult for people to come. And so when I say that, hey, we, we, we want to keep the outsiders, you know, in, in focus, we're saying we want to make sure our doors are wide open and irresistible for people to come. You know, I love this, and I, I'm short on time, but I'm going to say this anyway, and this, this person's probably going to get, you know, a bit upset with me. I don't know where Bruce is in here. Sorry, Bruce. The, Bruce works in our, our parking lot, and Bruce is the first picture of Jesus that people see when they pull on this campus. 
And Bruce doesn't care if you're an insider or an outsider. He just wants to help you find a parking spot because he wants you to feel comfortable here. And you know what's uncomfortable when you're a new person and you don't know where to park? Bruce is focused on the outsiders because he just wants everyone to have a parking spot. That's a simple way to look at it, but it's actually a really valuable way to look at it. Is that we don't ever want to be an inside focus group where when someone else comes in here, maybe from the outside, like maybe you want to invite one of your coworkers from work to come, and then they come and they're like, it kind of just felt like I was around like this weird sort of a social club that I wasn't a part of. And this church doesn't really have that problem because I watch you out there at tea and coffee talking to all kinds of people. But I want you to know that if you are an insider, this is important, you still do matter to us. The insiders are, are the ones that are discipling. They're the ones that are helping people. They're the ones that set up communion for us today. They're the ones that are in the parking lot. They're the ones on our prayer team. They're the ones that are serving your kids and family ministries. They're the ones that are, that are tithing. Those are the ones, I mean, as, as an insider, you're making the church work. And thank you for that. Praise God for you. Praise God that you made a decision to make this place your home. Thank you so much for that. And because of your heart as an insider that it's always looking to make the outsiders feel welcome, then guess what? We become an irresistible church. Why are we an irresistible church? Because you and others are irresistible to God. Now, the, the next thing that we want to be careful of about our drift here is that we don't want to drift from people to policy. So we, we always want to see the person before we see the policy. So one of the things that we did here, here's an example of that is, is in, in our, our service here, we used to say, hey, we don't want to offend people that are coming to church. We don't want to be offensive. Maybe somebody's coming for the first time, and we don't want them to be offended by the stuff that, that we're doing. So let's make sure that we're a non-offensive space. And that really became a policy. That meant you said this, and that meant you did this, and you kind of ticked tick the boxes. Well, what we did is we changed it. And we, we still kind of keep to the same principles, but we changed it and we said, you know what, people, let's instead put a value system in place. So you know what our value system is in this environment right here? It's safety. So we went back to people. So we want to make sure that people, when they walk in here, they feel safe. We want you to feel safe inviting your friends to come to church. Why? Because Jesus loves you. Why? Because you're irresistible to God. That's how we become an irresistible church. People walk in here and they say, wow, I was so welcomed. I felt so cared for. This was such a warm church. I didn't feel like an outsider. I felt like I was a part of this thing. I felt like I mattered. People will always matter more to us than policy. So another thing that we want to watch about with our drift is that we don't want to drift towards preserving over advancing. Now, this is the best one to me, especially as, as someone new coming in to, to lead the church a couple years ago, because people do want to preserve what they have. You know, that, that, that's what the Jewish people were doing. They kept going back to this thing of Moses. They kept saying, yeah, but Moses is covenant. Moses is covenant. They need to do Moses' covenant. They were protecting their Jewish culture, and I don't blame them for that. That was their life. That was everything they'd sown into, into. I mean, that's their entire existence and their being. And they're just trying to protect it. They're trying to preserve what they felt like was so meaningful. And, and you know what? It is meaningful. And I don't want to take away from, 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 that, from their culture and what God did, because God did amazing things through the Jewish people. But somewhere along the line, they chose to preserve that while Paul and Barnabas chose to advance what God was doing. So as we grow, as we become irresistible and new people come in, it's okay for us to advance. Maybe that means we change things or adapt and all that stuff. But why do we want to advance over preserve? Because we always want to be pliable for God to use us for this community in the way that he wants us to use us. And so the, the, the last drift that I would talk about before we get ready to do communion is we don't want to drift away from grace. Guys, I, I'll never forget when grace 
touched me, what that felt like. Now, there was a season, I've told this story before, but there was a season in my life where I was really struggling with depression and I was um, really dealing with it in a hard way. And just to tell you the quick part of the story, I remember this is before I was at South Point, um, but I remember walking around Rondebosch Common and, and my wife and I were walking and we were talking about why am I still struggling with this? Why does it hurt so much? Why is God letting me go through so much pain? Why am I not cured? Why is this still a part of me? Why do I have so much anxiety? Why am I having panic attacks in my sleep? Why, why, like what, what exactly is happening? And why doesn't God take it away? And I just felt like, you know what? It's easier to believe that there is no God than it is to believe that there is a God and he's letting me hurt this much. And, and I remember just, I remember the tree that I was standing under at Rondebosch Common as we were walking around when I said that to Casey. And, and she didn't condemn me. She had grace for me. She just said, I know. I know it's hard. I know it's hard. But you know, when I look back on that moment, I, I never walked away from God and did, you know, anything that I regret from that. But I said those words. And when I look back on that moment, in my outwardly defiance of God, God just poured grace out for me. See, there were three people walking on that trail that day. There was Casey, there was me, and then there was a broken Jesus that hung on a cross for me, that hurt for me, that one of his children was hurting so badly. And that's when the Holy Spirit, my helper, goes to the throne room of God and literally groans on my behalf to God. And it was just a few days later after that, you know, thinking back on that situation, I remember being touched by God's grace. I've been touched by God's grace a thousand times in my life, and I hope it happens 10,000 times more. And I hope that it happens for you, that you're touched by God's grace. We don't ever want to drift away from grace. Every single Sunday, this is what I tell our team in the morning, our production team. Every single Sunday, people are going to walk through this door. And who's going to walk through the door today that needs to be touched by God's grace? Somebody here needs that touch. And every single week, we get the opportunity to give them that. That's just Sunday. The other six days a week, it's you guys, the church. That are, that are operating in a way that's allowing God's grace to touch people. Why? Because Jesus died for us. Why? Because we are irresistible to God. And together, we make up this irresistible church. Now, this verse in Hebrews that I have, it sums this thing up really well. It puts it uh, in, in, in such a great kind of context. And it says, And let us consider thoughtfully how we may encourage one another to love and to do good deeds. This is for you. This is, t take out Hebrews, because that allows you to disconnect and say, well, that's just in the Bible. Okay, this is for you. I'm talking to you. God's talking to you. And let us consider, let us consider thoughtfully how we may encourage one another to love and to do good deeds, not forsaking our meeting together. That means we do need to get together and meet as believers for worship and instruction. We've done that this morning. And as in the habit of some, but encourage one another. We encourage each other. We come together. That, that's what we are as a church. Let us consider thoughtfully how we may encourage one another to love and to do good deeds. Now, I go back to the verse in Acts 15 that James closed with. Therefore, it is my judgment that we do not trouble and make it difficult for those who are turning to God among the Gentiles by putting obstacles in their way. So my appeal to you is let's make this church irresistible. Let's make this place irresistible because it bothers me that there's people out there that don't know about the irresistible Jesus and the irresistible God that's in here. That's why we don't drift in those directions. Because we believe this is an irresistible space for people to come into. Because they were irresistible to God. You were irresistible to God.